Meet China's answer to the Jeep Wrangler. Now, with hybrid power. It's called the GWM Tank 300 Hybrid, and it's powered by a petrol electric powertrain designed to reduce your fuel bill while maximizing adventure time. And what about you? Would you buy a Chinese SUV? Have your say in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe. Priced from $55.90 for the base grade Lux Hybrid, we're testing the top spec Ultra model, which adds more equipment and luxury features, but both have the same fundamental on and off-road capability. Speaking of which, when we first torture tested the non-hybrid tank in mid-2023, we were pleasantly surprised with how capable it was. A good approach and departure angles, plenty of ground clearance, low range gearing and locking diffs front and rear saw it clamber across challenging tracks with effortless ease. The hybrid model retains all those off-road tricks, but it adds a big $10,000 premium for the hybrid system, which we'll get to in a minute. But one thing about this $61,000 vehicle that irks me is that it looks exactly the same as the $51,000 non-hybrid version. You know, a new set of wheels or maybe a unique paint job wouldn't have gone astray. So the only way you can tell this apart from the regular model is a blue HEV badge on the back. Rivals include the Jeep Wrangler, which is an $81,000 proposition without any hybrid gubbins. And given the tank's rugged body-on-frame underpinnings, vehicles like the Isuzu MUX and Ford Everest can be considered competitors as well. But again, they both cost more. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's a brave move using the tank name because if it ain't built like one, word of mouth is gonna kill it. We simply don't have a handle on this brand's long-term reliability yet. However, it does have a seven-year warranty and five years roadside assist, which is encouraging. Compared to the regular Tank 300, this two-liter turbo petrol engine is different. It's got a slightly larger displacement, it's got a slightly higher compression ratio. And when you throw in all the hybrid gubbins, including an electric motor, it pumps out way more muscle than its donor car. The hybrid bits add about 160 kilograms of mass, taking curb weight to just over 2.3 tons. It runs a nine-speed automatic transmission driving all four wheels through a Borg Warner setup. So you're essentially paying a 20% higher purchase price while getting around 10% better fuel efficiency. And in my mind, that equation doesn't add up. But look, we're gonna test it on the road, so we'll find out exactly how efficient it is soon enough. The interior has a rather premium look and feel, and it starts with these soft and supportive Nappa leather accented seats, which are heated and cooled and power adjustable as well. You've got the twin 12.3 inch digital screens and all the controls have a nice tactility to them for the most part. Although there is some cheap plastics here and there that bring the vibe down a little bit. There's heaps of room. It feels big and airy and the infotainment system is pretty cool with loads of functionality and it's easy to use. It comes with native sat-nav plus Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, not to mention one of the best reversing camera systems you'll find on a sub $100,000 vehicle. There's a palpable upmarket sense about this interior, but again, there's nothing to denote that it's a hybrid or the fact that it's $10,000 more than the almost identical looking non-hybrid model. You know, where's the blue stitching on the seats? Where's the EV button on the steering wheel? It's just not there. The only significant difference I could find in the cabin was the removal of the grab handle here, replaced with a driver attention system with an infrared and a little camera that incessantly beeps and bleeps at you during normal driving or when you're having a conversation with the passenger. I think it needs to be recalibrated perhaps, and you can turn it off with the touchscreen, but you have to do it every single time you start the car, or you can just tape over it. 
There's a few extra hybrid specific data sets on both the central touchscreen and the digital instrument panel, but the lack of extra bling feels like an opportunity missed. The back seat has plenty of head and leg room and the seats like the front are really good. They're equal parts supportive and comfortable and that Nappa leather accented finish is great. There's also some nice finishes on the doors. It's got an upmarket feel. Plus you've got good amenity, twin USB A ports, twin adjustable air vents and the ubiquitous fold out central armrest with twin cup holders. If like me, you've got kids, it's also good to see twin ISO fix and also three top tether child seat anchorages. I love the fact you've got a full size spare tire on the rear tailgate, which means it's a barn style opening door. The gas strut can be locked, so when it's windy, the door won't slam shut. The boot itself is not huge, but not tiny, which isn't too bad considering you've got that massive battery under there. Amenity is pretty good too. You've got the 220 volt power point there, the 12 volt socket, plus tie down hooks and 60-40 split folding rear seats to open up more boot space. And it'll tow 2.5 tons, which ain't bad for a hybrid. All right, time to see how much fuel that hybrid module can save us. Cue the driving music. First and foremost, the extra punch provided by the electric motor makes the tank feel way more responsive, accelerating with more tenacity now. Flick it into sport mode and it fires away from the traffic lights. And that's all good and well, but isn't the idea here to save fuel, not burn more of it? Around town and in the suburbs, the hybrid system does its best work. It'll stay in EV mode at low speeds, up to around 40 kilometers an hour. And we did get it up to 50 kilometers an hour down a slope, but you need to accelerate very slowly, just like a Toyota hybrid. And while it has a bigger, denser battery pack than most plugless hybrids from Toyota, its chubby curb mass hurts the hybrid's effectiveness. The trip computer reckoned I'd get 850 kilometers from a full tank of fuel, which is 75 liters. And while it gets better mileage and fuel economy than the regular Tank 300, it's far from remarkable. At freeway speeds, the powertrain tends to turn off the electric motor. So you're essentially just lugging around 160 kilograms of cobalt and manganese. Where it does impress is its ability to deliver a refined and quiet driving experience. There's way less tire noise than in a Jeep Wrangler and ride comfort is pretty good. It's supple enough to smooth out lumpy roads and speed humps. That said, handling dynamics are a bit woolly, but so are most off-road SUVs of this size and weight. The ultralight steering is good around town and in the suburbs, but can feel a bit sensitive on the freeway. The adaptive cruise control is okay, but the autonomous steering system is rubbish. It's reactive rather than proactive and bounces between the lanes rather than staying centered. And it's really aggressive with the steering corrections too. We don't have time to test it off road on this launch review, but it should be pretty good, particularly with an extra 268 Newton meters of torque. Based on this brief launch drive, I'm not convinced that $10,000 premium for an electric motor and the battery are worth it. This is an exceedingly heavy vehicle and it still drinks like a thirsty horse. And while it's very pleasant to drive around town and should be rock solid off road, I think for a lot of people, the standard Tank 300 will represent better value. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below. Would you pay an extra 10 grand for a hybrid system on top of a base vehicle? Or even better, would you buy a Chinese car?